We've all experienced failure, but the difference between those who succeed and those who don't ultimately comes down to one thing, resilience. Resilience requires three things, taking control of negative emotions, enhancing your mindset, and improving your health. But how does that actually work? To understand that, we need to understand the neuroscience of resilience. This video is a deep dive into the science of human resilience. By the end, you'll have a strong understanding of what it takes your brain to bounce back from challenges and setbacks. Step one, take control of negative emotions. Failure hurts. We've all experienced the sting of rejection and loss, and we naturally try to avoid that pain in the future. But for any important goal, Failure and setbacks are inevitable, so completely avoiding failure also means avoiding success. This is why understanding and controlling negative emotions is so important. While the biology of specific emotions is complicated and not completely understood, there is something common to many intense negative emotions, the activation of what's called the distress system. This is a network of five brain regions, the amygdala, prefrontal cortex, thalamus, insula, and hypothalamus. But how does this network actually function? It begins with the amygdala. You've probably heard of the amygdala, which is often called the fear center, but that's not quite true. The amygdala is a collection of densely packed clusters of neurons that respond not only to threatening or scary stimuli, but anything of biological importance, meaning anything that has to do with our well-being, survival, or reproduction. Still, some studies have shown that the amygdala is responsive to threatening information in particular, and this makes good evolutionary sense because it would have been important for our ancestors to be hyper-vigilant about anything that threatened their lives. So whenever we perceive something as threatening, the amygdala activates and triggers the activation of the rest of the distress system. It sends signals simultaneously to three other brain regions, which together make for an extremely, usually unpleasant experience. One of these is the thalamus, a brain region where sensory information coming from the eyes, ears, and other sensory organs flows through before it gets to the cerebral cortex. When the thalamus receives a signal from the amygdala, it filters information coming from the sensory systems to search for potential threats while ignoring more positive information. This makes us uneasy by influencing us to attend to potentially threatening stimuli. Next, your amygdala also sends signals to your hypothalamus, and this triggers the fight or flight response in your body. You have adrenaline released followed by the stress hormone cortisol. Your heart rate quickens, blood pressure rises, pupils dilate, and muscles tense up. Now finally, your amygdala sends a signal to the prefrontal cortex or PFC. Now this region is heavily involved in our ability to set goals, predict outcomes, plan for the future, and regulate emotions. In this context, the amygdala influences the PFC to predict that danger is imminent and to set a goal for the rest of the brain to be ready to confront or escape the threat. The PFC also communicates with the thalamus, reinforcing the amygdala's message and making you even more sensitive to negative information in your environment. But a question arises, why do emotions actually feel unpleasant? Now, the first answer to that question is that your brain interprets all these signals as negative but that still doesn't answer the question of why it interprets it negatively and why it actually feels like that in your body. Well, your physiology has changed considerably from what it was a few moments ago, right? You experience these bodily changes as interoceptive feelings, sensations in your body. This is accomplished by a brain region known as the anterior insular cortex, which acts like a map of changes happening in your body. The anterior insula receives complex information about the body gathered from millions of nerves sensing everything from changes in tissue oxygenation to cellular damage to vasodilation to stomach acidity and so on. It then has to predict what all that information means. So it creates a kind of summary of what's happening inside you combined with the information about the context around you. This summary you experience as feelings in your body. So how can you take control of that process? Well, just understanding this circuit gives us insight into how to regulate emotions more effectively. Since the process starts with the amygdala setting off an alarm in the brain, the key is to shut that alarm system off. The brain region best situated to do that is the prefrontal cortex, specifically a region known as the posterior orbital frontal cortex. 
or POFC, which has a direct inhibitory connection to the amygdala. In fact, this connection is unique, and it's the only region that connects directly to an area of the amygdala called the intercalated masses. Now, the intercalated masses are clusters of inhibitory GABA-producing neurons that, when activated, drastically reduce the activity of the rest of the amygdala. They act kind of like an emergency break. So when the POFC is engaged, it sends a neural impulse to the intercalated masses of the amygdala, which engages the brakes and severely slows the amygdala's activity. This has a calming effect. So then how do you actually engage that POFC to amygdala connection? How do you slow the amygdala's activity? One of the simplest ways is to put the emotion you're feeling into words. Like say you've just had some really negative feedback on a project you've been working on for months. Try to specifically identify what you're feeling beyond just bad or upset. Maybe you're feeling dejected or jilted or disrespected. This is called affect labeling and it has been found to reduce amygdala activity while increasing LPFC activity. A more in-depth set of strategies is called cognitive reappraisal, which is all about reinterpreting stressful events to change their emotional impact. So you might reframe negative feedback as a chance to improve your work. This makes it a more positive experience. You can also adopt someone else's perspective or imagine yourself as an outsider and ask, what would I tell my friend if this happened to him? This tactic has been shown to reduce amygdala activity and also it seems to rely on the LPFC. Interestingly, studies have shown that stimulating the LPFC during cognitive reappraisal can enhance the effect of cognitive reappraisal. Now these tactics are great for changing how you view stressful situations, but they don't really tell you what to do when you feel powerless. What about when things just seem hopeless? Now, research on the concept of learned helplessness shows that if you repeatedly face stressful situations where you believe that there's absolutely nothing you can do, you'll eventually just give up. This by itself is pretty miserable, but unfortunately it won't stop there. In the future, when you face something stressful, even if it is totally within your control, you'll be less likely to even try to do anything about it. Understanding the neuroscience behind learned helplessness can help you get a grip and take back a feeling of control. As we look into the research on the brain basis of learned helplessness, I wanna be clear though that much of this work, most of it, has been done only in rodents rather than human subjects. The most important brain region in learned helplessness appears to be a specific area of the brainstem called the dorsal raphae nucleus, or DRN. This is one of the primary brain areas that synthesizes the neurotransmitter serotonin. During uncontrollable stress, the DRN releases a flood of serotonin into the brain, which triggers helplessness. Several studies have demonstrated that preventing the release of serotonin from the DRN inhibits the onset of learned helplessness in rodents. So how does the DRN do this? It sends serotonin to two regions, the amygdala and the periaqueductal gray. As we've seen, the amygdala is involved in anxiety, but the periaqueductal gray is involved in instinctive behaviors like running away from or fighting off an attacker. It seems that the DRN simultaneously activates the amygdala and inhibits the periaqueductal gray. This leads to anxiety and a felt inability to take action. But what if the animal does have control over the stressor? In this scenario, there is a wholly different pattern of brain activity playing out. While the dorsal raphae activates, something else happens that rapidly inhibits its activity. The prefrontal cortex jumps into action and inhibits the DRN. At the same time, the PFC stimulates an area involved in goal-directed behavior called the caudate. The animal takes control, escapes the stressor, and has a lasting change to its brain. That is, when a stressor presents itself in the future, the PFC's automatic reaction is now to inhibit the DRN. The mouse has effectively unlearned helplessness. Okay, great, but you're not a mouse, right? So what does all this mean for you? Human psychological research suggests that something similar does happen in your brain. By taking control of your reaction to the situation in whatever small way you can, the brain shuts down the feeling of helplessness and anxiety while simultaneously engaging circuits involved in creating and pursuing goals. In other words, by taking action in stressful situations, you empower yourself and shift your brain to be more resilient. 
Okay, so far we've discussed the first step in building resilience, which is regulating negative emotions and distress. But that's really only one-third of the process. So now we need to tackle the second step, enhancing your mindset. Have you ever met someone who seems happy no matter what's going on in their life? They seem to be able to bounce back from almost any negative experience with a smile on their face. Well, some research indicates that this may not be a coincidence. Highly resilient people tend to feel more positive emotions and have a more optimistic attitude in general. As we'll see, in the brain, both positive emotions and optimism have a strong relationship with the dopamine system. On the other hand, reduced responsiveness of this system is closely associated with conditions like major depressive disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. But why would this be? To answer that, we need to look at the dopamine system in more detail. Now, dopamine is a crucial neurotransmitter in the brain, involved in various functions, including reward, motivation, memory, attention, and even regulating bodily movements. Enhanced cognitive flexibility, working memory, cognitive control, reward sensitivity, and motivation are all results of optimal dopamine levels. So it makes sense that people who are more resilient would have more responsive dopamine systems. But why does dopamine actually have these effects? Now, dopamine is produced mainly in neurons residing in two adjacent areas of the upper brainstem, the ventral tegmental area and the substantia nigra. These neurons connect to several other brain regions in a distinct pattern, forming three separate dopamine pathways. First is the mesolimbic pathway. Now, this one starts in the ventral tegmental area, and it projects to various limbic structures, notably the nucleus accumbens, which is a key region of the brain's reward system. The mesolimbic pathway is primarily associated with reward and pleasure, and it's activated by rewarding stimuli, such as food, social interactions, and recreational drugs. This pathway is extremely important for motivation and habit formation. It makes the organism much more likely to engage in whatever behavior preceded its activation. Okay, second is the mesocortical pathway. Like the mesolimbic pathway, the mesocortical pathway also originates in the ventral tegmental area. It projects to the prefrontal cortex, particularly areas involved in cognitive control, including planning, decision-making, problem-solving, and controlling impulses. Now, this pathway plays a key role in attention and working memory. And finally, the nigrostriatal pathway. This pathway starts in the substantia nigra and projects primarily to the basal ganglia. The nigrostriatal pathway is primarily involved in motor control and the coordination of movement. Dopamine release in this pathway helps to regulate movements and facilitate smooth execution of motor tasks, while damage to this pathway is the cause of Parkinson's disease. Okay, so optimal dopamine levels lead to motivation, cognitive control, future planning, better working memory, and better attention. And dopamine is intimately tied to feelings of pleasure as well as physical activity. Of course, all of these are important aspects of resilience, but that's actually only half of why this system is so important for resilience. Scientists have found that engaging the reward system, the dopamine system, reduces cortisol levels in later tasks. That is, not only does dopamine directly contribute to resilience by enhancing cognitive function and positive affect, but it also buffers negative affect and stress. But why would that be the case? One reason is that the dopamine system has influence over the distress system. The ventral striatum and prefrontal cortex have direct connections to the hypothalamus, which, as we saw, activates the stress response. Plus, remember that the prefrontal cortex has a direct inhibitory connection to the amygdala. And finally, the mesolimbic pathway includes a connection between the ventral tegmental area and the amygdala. So it's possible that these connections provide the anatomical basis of the reduced stress response following rewarding stimuli. However, one complication with this idea is that dopamine can actually make the amygdala more reactive, but that seems to only occur at maybe unnaturally high levels of dopamine. Regardless, it's clear that pleasure and reward do inhibit the stress response. When it comes to pleasure, dopamine is not even the most important molecule, though. Instead, a class of neurotransmitters called endogenous opioids 
are more important for the actual pleasure that we experience. These are actually the same molecules that are released in response to pain and physical exertion, and they bind to the receptors that morphine and other painkillers bind to. Scientists have found that blocking a specific type of opioid receptor called the mu receptor prevents the stress-reducing effects of rewarding stimuli in rats. So it seems that the dopamine and opioid systems are intertwined and together are important for human resilience. But that leaves open a major question. How do we use this knowledge to enhance our own resilience? I mean, it's not as simple as just activating the dopamine or opioid systems. If that were the case, all that would be required for resilience would be to take dopamine and opioid enhancing drugs, like heroin and cocaine. But that's obviously not the case. Now, to understand why these systems are important for resilience and how to use them properly, we have to turn to psychology. Specifically, we have to turn to the branch of psychology most concerned with human flourishing and happiness, known as positive psychology. In general, having a positive attitude seems to be important for human resilience. According to Broaden and Build Theory, which was originated by the psychologist Barbara Fredrickson, positive emotions lead to a heightened ability to deal with future stressors. The Broaden aspect refers to the immediate effects of positive emotions. For example, joy sparks the urge to play and be creative. Love leads us to nurture supportive relationships. Curiosity encourages exploration and learning. And contentment inspires contemplation and integration of new experiences into one's overall worldview. The build aspect, on the other hand, is the long-term impact. For example, the relationships we nurture after experiencing love and connection will be important when we need help in the future. Now, overall, Fredrickson's theory highlights a self-sustaining cycle. Positive emotions lead to broader behavioral patterns, which help to build enduring personal resources. And that, in turn, enhances the likelihood of experiencing positive emotions in the future. So how do we actually enhance positive emotions in a rational way? What kinds of activities will boost our positivity and at the same time enhance resilience? Let's look at some of the most powerful interventions. When we expect things to go well, they are more likely to go well. That might seem crazy, but there is empirical support for the idea that an optimistic or hopeful attitude is not only associated with stronger health and well-being, but also better educational outcomes. This isn't magic. When we expect things to go well, as opposed to expecting the worst, we're more likely to take action and to overcome obstacles that come our way because we're more likely to see the possibilities rather than just the pitfalls. But of course, this is only true insofar as our optimism reflects reality. If we ignore problems and operate in a kind of manic state of mind, it's only a matter of time before reality crashes in on us. Yet if we focus on the positive, including the potential opportunities, we're more likely to achieve our goals because we'll have the motivation to keep going when the going gets tough. Relating this to the brain, several lines of evidence support the idea that the dopamine systems play a causal role in optimism. For example, on the most basic level, simply expecting a positive outcome is associated with a spike in dopaminergic neuron activity in the ventral tegmental area. The great thing is that we can practice optimism. One way of doing this is to imagine a brighter future that you can create. A 2020 study published in the Journal of Positive Psychology by Adair, Kennedy, and Sexton studied the effects of psychological tools designed by the authors, one of which is called Looking Forward. In their sample, they found that using this tool every few days for about a month led to significant decreases in symptoms of depression, as well as increases in optimism, thriving, and emotional recovery from adversity, aka resilience. What's great about this tool is its simplicity. The key is to look to the far future, then write down something that you hope to experience or something you're looking forward to, and finally describe the feelings you have about those things. But then you have to be consistent. You have to do this at least every few days. Interestingly, it seems that this kind of forward mental time travel relies on the same brain systems dedicated to memory and thinking about ourselves like the hippocampus and default mode network. Yet, to build a more positive mindset, you don't have to live only in the future. The past can also be a rich source of positive emotions. Gratitude, for example, uh, expressing gratitude by writing thank you letters or journaling about what you're grateful for can enhance well-being. 
Studies have shown that these kinds of activities can increase psychological well-being and one's general level of gratitude. Finally, simply reflecting on positive events can build a more optimistic mindset over time. For example, the Three Good Things exercise developed by Positive Psychology's founder, Martin Seligman, is something I do every day and which has been a major part of my growing positivity over the last year. This exercise is simple. At the end of your day, or whenever you have time really, write down three good things that occurred in the past 24 hours, what role you played in making them happen, and how they made you feel. That's it. You can do it in as little as five to 10 minutes, and research indicates that when this is done on a daily basis, it has a lasting effect on positivity, optimism, and even overall flourishing. Now, of course, these exercises are great for building a more positive outlook in preparations for the challenges ahead. But what about when things actually get tough? The problem with these interventions so far is that they might seem shallow. And as you might suspect, the strongest forms of resilience require something much deeper. And this brings us to purpose. In 1889, the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche wrote, quote, he who has a why to live for can bear with almost any how, end quote. Many years later, after surviving a concentration camp during the Holocaust, the psychologist Viktor Frankl explained that Nietzsche's quote captured the essence of what was required for someone to survive the horrors of concentration camps. Frankl wrote, quote, any attempt to restore man's inner strength in the camp had first to succeed in showing him some future goal, end quote. Indeed, it seems that purpose is a critical ingredient in the most robust forms of human resilience. But what is purpose? How do we cultivate it? Yet another human testament to resilience helps clarify these questions. The novelist and philosopher Ayn Rand fled Soviet Russia in 1926, heading to the United States and never looking back. Rand had known since she was nine years old that she wanted to be a writer, and she doggedly pursued this as her life's purpose, eventually becoming one of the most influential and controversial American writers of the 20th century. Regarding purpose, Rand had this to say in 1964, quote, a central purpose serves to integrate all the other concerns of a man's life. It establishes the hierarchy, the relative importance of his values. It saves him from pointless inner conflicts. It permits him to enjoy life on a wide scale and to carry that enjoyment into any area open to his mind. Whereas a man without purpose is lost in chaos." End quote. Studies have repeatedly shown that Nietzsche, Frankl, and Rand were right. For example, a 2022 study of nearly 400 students during the COVID-19 pandemic found that those who agreed with statements like, my purpose in life is clear, I have become more certain about my future goals, and I'm striving to make a positive difference in society, were more resilient and persistent than their peers. Interestingly, the statements that most strongly predicted resilience and persistence were those associated with the psychological construct known as awakening to purpose. These include statements like, I've started thinking about what I truly want to achieve. But on the other hand, the construct of altruistic purpose, measured by agreement to statements like, I seek to serve society in many ways, large and small, showed the weakest correlation with resilience and persistence. With these insights, one clear path to resilience emerges. Decide on what you value most in life and pursue it wholeheartedly. This has to come from within. It has to be an ambitious goal that you truly want to achieve and which is in fact achievable. As many of us have found, this goal may change over time and it may not just be one thing, right? It may be a vision of your overall life that you're shooting for. But cultivating purpose is a lifelong process. Once you achieve your highest goal, you have to set an even higher and more meaningful and purposeful goal and then keep striving. But what happens when you fail? All of us will fail to reach at least one of our goals at some point. So what should we do then? This brings us to the growth mindset. The poet Maya Angelou was asked in 1973 what she would tell her daughter about growing up in America. Her response could serve as a powerful life lesson for all of us. She said, quote, I would say you might encounter many defeats, but you must never be defeated, ever. In fact, it might even be necessary to confront defeat it might be necessary to get over it all the way through it." End quote. This embodies what the psychologist Carol Dweck calls the growth mindset. Growth mindset is a belief in one's ability to learn and improve in any area. 
despite setbacks, and sometimes because of those setbacks. On the other hand, a fixed mindset is the idea that your abilities are basically unchangeable. So any failure or setback is an indicator of the limits of your innate capabilities. Some controversy has erupted in recent years over just how effective holding growth mindset is for, for example, improving students' academic performance. However, research has generally shown that shifting from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset is associated with improvements in performance, especially for students who are struggling the most. But why would this actually be? Well, this makes sense in light of the emerging neuroscience of growth mindset. One study found that growth mindset was associated with greater connectivity between the striatum, right, which we saw as part of the dopamine system, and two other regions, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is involved in cognitive control, and the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, which is involved in error monitoring and cost-benefit analysis of behavior. This may indicate that the brain's error detection system and cognitive control system are more tightly linked to motivational and goal-directed systems. Another study found that growth mindset was correlated with the gray matter volume of the left medial orbital frontal cortex. This is part of a brain region that's involved in tamping down the activity of the amygdala, but it's also involved in determining how valuable a given option is, as well as in the experience of pleasure. Now, in my view, growth mindset seems particularly relevant for resilience. The research seems to bear this out, too. Indeed, growth mindset has been found to enhance resilience for adolescents facing cyberbullying and for individuals who have faced childhood abuse or neglect. Growth mindset is fundamentally about improving despite serious challenges and setbacks. It's about setting and striving for meaningful and ambitious goals in all areas of life. It's about knowing that small defeats will occur, but as Maya Angelou put it, you must never be defeated, ever. So resilience requires you to change how your brain works, but your brain doesn't work by itself. It's dependent on a much larger biological system, your body. And this raises a question, does resilience depend on physical health? Let's look at two major areas, exercise and sleep. Out of curiosity, how strong is your grip strength and how far can you jump and land upright? Now, what if I told you that your answers to these questions can help predict your level of psychological resilience? Now, it's not that resilience is determined by hand or leg strength, but instead that these are proxies for overall physical strength. If your grip strength is high and you can jump relatively far, then you're probably pretty strong overall. Now, other studies have shown that our level of physical activity also predicts psychological resilience including lower rates of depression, anxiety, and even age-related neurological diseases. One mechanism by which these beneficial effects occur is the release of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF, which helps neurons to grow and aids in neuroplasticity, especially in the brain's most important memory-related region, the hippocampus, which is one of the first areas affected by Alzheimer's disease. According to the authors of a 2021 review, Quote, BDNF is released from the brain into the circulation during a single bout of endurance-based exercise and after three months of endurance training, end quote. Interestingly, depression may be partly caused by a lack of neuroplasticity, and BDNF may be important for the mood-boosting effects of exercise. Additionally, exercise is hard, right? It's a self-imposed source of stress, but it occurs in a positive psychological context. This combination can lead to a phenomenon known as stress inoculation, where brief, controllable, and even enjoyable stressors lead to lower stress reactivity in general. To engage ourselves in physical challenges requires self-control, which as we've seen is a function of the prefrontal cortex, and exercise has been found in at least some studies to increase the volume of the PFC. So enhancing self-control and prefrontal cortical function might be a mechanism through which exercise contributes to psychological resilience. But finally, exercise is known also to enhance dopamine signaling. For example, one study in rats showed that a six-week high-intensity interval training regimen led to increased binding to dopamine D2 receptors in the nucleus accumbens. Again, we saw this brain region as important for expectation of reward and for pleasure. Again, the dopamine system plays a role in enhancing human resilience and it appears that exercise may help optimize the functioning of this system. But once again, physical health is not just about working out. 
You also need to rest and recover. And the most important aspect of rest and recovery is sleep. But does sleep have a measurable benefit on resilience? Sleep helps us recover from stress and trauma, and it's associated with a lower risk of depression. The duration and quality of sleep are linked to emotional well being, cognitive function, and resilience. Now, two main neurobiological pathways by which sleep improves resilience are the distress and dopamine pathways. First, the distress pathway. Sleep deprivation reduces the functional connectivity between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. Now, as we've seen throughout this video, the PFC is involved in regulating the amygdala. So reduced connectivity between these two brain regions can make it more difficult to control emotional responses and it can increase vulnerability to stress. Second, the reward processing pathway. Sleep deprivation leads to disrupted activity in reward-related regions, such as the MPFC and nucleus accumbens. This activity is crucial for evaluating situations accurately and responding adaptively, which are essential aspects of psychological resilience. Sleep deprivation also downregulates dopamine receptors in the ventral striatum. Now, in addition to these two main pathways, sleep also affects memory and cognitive function. During sleep, there's a specific type of communication between the hippocampus and the cerebral cortex, which leads to consolidation of memories, including positive memories. This could help to build resilience by providing a store of positive memories and self-beliefs that can be drawn upon during times of stress. And finally, dreaming may also play a role in resilience. Some scientists believe that dreams are a way for the brain to process and consolidate emotional experiences. Disruption of REM sleep, the stage of sleep in which most dreaming tends to occur, has been linked to increased vulnerability to stress. This suggests that dreaming may help to prepare us for potentially stressful events and that disruption of REM sleep may inhibit resilience. So the neuroscience of resilience provides us with valuable insights into the mechanisms underlying our ability to recover from setbacks. By actively engaging in practices that regulate our emotional state, foster positive psychological attitudes, and maintain our physical well-being, we can enhance our capacity to navigate life's challenges effectively. Through understanding and applying these principles, we can empower ourselves to lead more fulfilled and more resilient lives. But resilience in general requires a great deal of flexibility. You have to be able to creatively respond to obstacles and adjust your strategy when difficulties present themselves. That's not easy to do. But the good news is that you can train this ability by watching this video right here.